Taylor, you are a hedge fund manager in the United States that moved your hedge fund to Shenzhen. Why do you want to be in China? I think it's a sign of the times. Okay. Uh, it's the investment opportunities in China are far outnumber those in the United States. And the United States has kind of had its time mm -hmm. with, I mean, our focus is high tech, new tech, clean tech, and green tech. Okay. So if you look around, I mean, this city that we're in has electrified their entire bus fleet, their entire taxi fleet. Yeah. The taxi fleet was larger than all of Europe's electric vehicle fleet wow. up until a few years ago. Jeez. So things move way faster here. Okay. They have a government who is more supportive and encouraging of these innovations. Mm -hmm. And for us, that was just too obvious of an opportunity to not at least participate here. Okay. Moving here was a different thing. Yeah. Um, before COVID, we had no intention of moving here. Okay. We definitely intended on planning, it, we planned on four to five months a year, mm -hmm. just for research here, boots okay. on the ground. Right. And then COVID happened and these companies in China don't really operate the same way as maybe in the West. Right. They don't like the Zoom calls. They right. want, if, if you care enough about our company and want to invest in our company, you come here. Okay. We couldn't do that. Right, right, so right. we started looking into how could we get there maybe as temporary residents or something. Right. And then the more we looked at it and the United States has kind of been going downhill mm -hmm. and China had been going only uphill. Right. So the more we looked at it, um, we kind of were teasing with the idea of maybe just for a year. Yeah. We, we relocate. Okay. You know, in terms of not staying in hotels, but like get an apartment and everything. Right. And, and then the more we looked at, the more seriously we talked about it, we were like, I think we need to move there for wow. at least three years. Wow. Amazing. And one week in, I think we've determined collectively that it's, uh, it's looking like five years. Okay. Um, so it, it's, I was quoted in uh, um, an article, I forget by whom, saying, I feel like an idiot for not moving to China sooner. Okay. My colleagues were like, Taylor, like, let's not say I feel like an idiot in you know, a publication, but right. that is how I feel. Right, I right. really feel like an idiot for not moving here sooner. Okay. I'd wow. been coming to China Incredible. many times, but yeah. to move here is completely different as you know. Taylor, let's go back to the beginning. Like when did your China journey begin? You know, how many, you know, were you, have you ever lived in China before? You know, or were you just visiting for, you know, to, to learn about these companies? Tell us about your, you know, the beginning of your China journey. Yeah, so I, I started with the language. Okay. Um, and actually, that's the worst part uh, of my China experience is my Chinese isn't great okay. working on it. But uh, that's how I, I, I started. Okay. I just took a Mandarin class. Yeah. And in a Mandarin class versus maybe a Spanish or a Latin or a French class, you really have to learn about the culture. Right. And that was something that it was like a two pronged type of learning experience. It okay. was, okay, here's something that, here's why I need to learn this word, but here's why the, these two characters make this word. And okay. here is the history lesson behind that. Right. And so that was just too exciting. And so I needed to go to China. Okay. And so I, I believe the first time was 2011. Okay. And China was very different than it is now. Yeah. A day in Beijing, the first city that I went to, was the air pollution was so bad that it was the equivalent of smoking multiple packs of cigarettes a day. Right. And so I kind of saw China through a different lens at that time. I, okay. I, I was too young to really see as much opportunity as I see now. Right. But it was it was a good experience. And then that just really pushed me to learn more about China. Yeah, yeah. And, and more actually about, yeah, the, the culture than the language. But then as you learn about the culture, then you have to start learning more about the language. And so Absolutely. it's, it's uh, yeah, this push definitely. and pull thing. Yeah, definitely related. And I think it's amazing because I my journey, uh, China journey began in 2007 and it was it was a very different China then. And what I think you've seen is you've seen this modern progression and you've seen rules and regulations come in. You've just seen it, China adapt to become a much more modern and sophisticated society, adapt kind of these international standards in many ways. For example, I remember when I first moved here, you know, drinking and driving was very big here in China. It was a massive problem, but the government came in and, you know, established these rules and regulations to bring that up to an international standard. And, you know, and then as far as the air quality, I can remember back in the day as well, um, that was a huge problem in China, but it's improved a lot. I mean, it's really not an issue anymore in China. I mean, it's nothing like it was back, uh, back in the day, you know, 10, right. 15 years ago, right? right? So it's much better. How about, how about this, Taylor? I'm quite fascinated by how, how do you do this? How are you and your team are Americans here? How could you move a hedge fund from the United States into China? I mean, that must have been incredibly difficult. I'd love for you to explain to everybody how you've done that, because I believe you're the only Americans that have done this. Yeah. And I think the government has confirmed that. 
yep. which is quite a feather in your cap. So congrats on that. But yeah, thank you. tell us how that, that whole thing happened. Uh, so one of our analysts, Bridget, she actually, when we determined that we need to move to China, yeah. from that point on, her full-time job until we stepped foot in China was to move our company there. All right, everybody. Well, we've gone outside of the office from Snowball Capital, and we are in one of the amazing parks here. We're joined by Bridget. And Bridget, I want to know about your decision to come to China because this is actually quite fascinating. You came to China and with Snowball Capital yes. without ever visiting Asia before. That's right. Yep. Yeah, so I had tell us that. never traveled to Asia before. Um, I'd always wanted to, but I hadn't made it here yet. And when I started at Snowball Capital in 2018, moving to China was not on the agenda at all. Yeah. Um, I knew it would entail a lot of visits to Asia more broadly, but definitely was not expecting to move here. But I have absolutely zero regrets. Nice. Because this, this process of getting here has made me much, much more informed about what China really is. Mm -hmm. And by the time I was actually ready to come here and we had done the visa process, we had formed our company, it had been a year and a half since we started the process. So I was full on research mode. I was ready to come. I was just excited. And I think I had kind of taken that year and a half to get over the nervousness of being in a completely new culture. Right. And I was like, oh, I just want to get there. Like, yeah, yeah. So by the time I got here, of course, I was nervous about the culture shock and my Mandarin is terrible <laughs> working on it. Yeah. But I just was so excited for the opportunity. And I can fully say it's been a hundred times better than I could have ever imagined. That's incredible. Yeah. Well, I want everybody to look at because uh, Bridget, I think you're originally from uh, from Boston, right? Is yes. that where you guys are moving from? Yep. And one of the things that you just had mentioned to me was that the quality of life here in Shenzhen specifically is just world class. I mean, we're about a, a five minute walk from your office here. What were some of the things that you were worried about? You know, what were some of the things that maybe you've heard in our media mm -hmm. that, that, you know, did you have any concerns? What was, what was it like? Well, what's funny is that when we first decided to move to China, geopolitical tensions were bad, but not as bad as they are now. Right. So the idea of moving to China wasn't that crazy, even as an American. And then as we started going through the process, it started getting harder and harder to explain to our family and friends why we were coming here. Right. And then, of course, every day there's a new news story about why China and the U.S. aren't getting along. So it was just it became harder. It really wasn't hard to justify, but for people who don't have an open mind, it became harder to explain to them. Yeah. So I think I had a little bit of worry that when I got here, I was actually concerned about maybe not being welcomed as an American. Okay. That didn't happen. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that no, didn't that's, it, that, that's one thing that thing is incredible is just how uh, welcome and remember, I think it's the curiosity, right, oh, totally. from the Chinese, right? They're totally. they're always they want to know where are you from, of course. you know. And it's and I think what's also important for people to understand is that the average Chinese knows significantly more about America than the average American knows about China. So if anything, they're almost looking at, hey, here's an American, you know, you know, tell us more because you know, is it like this? We've heard this. But they're certainly curious is always a word that I use to describe. That has been absolutely amazing. It's it's curiosity, absolutely. And it's also just how educated the Chinese people are. Yeah. And I knew that. I, I always knew that Chinese people were highly, highly intelligent. Yeah. But I didn't expect them to be so well versed. And it's not just the Chinese people know about a lot, a lot about the U.S. I mean, they know about Canada. They know yeah. about Europe. They're following everything. And that is a huge culture shock in the best way because Americans are so conceited and they don't know anything about any other culture right. because they just don't care to know. Right. Meeting people who know about the U.S. better than I do, yeah. I mean, that's embarrassing uh, sometimes, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, totally. So it, it's encouraging, actually, to learn more about global politics, relationships. I mean, it's it's really impressive. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. Um, Bridget, what is what is one thing that you really want the world to know about China? What's one thing you really want to you know, one point you really want to hammer home? I think, I mean, it's a tough question. There are so many, but something I want to hammer home is that generally China as a country has a positive outlook on the rest of the world. I think, nice. especially listening to mainstream media, really in any country, you kind of think of China as this almost dictatorship. They're pushing other people down. They're bullying countries. They're trying to become this global superpower. That's just not how I perceive it, being on the ground here. That's yeah. not what people talk about in general. That's, That's not. Right. And also the fact, the argument that the government is constantly involved in people's day-to-day -day life. I mean, that's just not the reality. Yeah. People are generally very happy, very intelligent, 
They know what's going on. They also trust their government. They're not concerned for their day-to-day -day well-being. And I can't say that about pretty much any other country. So yeah, yeah. I, I think I think what's interesting, Bridget, is you know in the U.S. we we have this idea that, for example, everyone in China is worried about you know, the government and that they're talking about the government and that they're oppressed from the government. But really, in reality, most Chinese people, they, uh, you know, they, they have a very normal life here. Yes. Right. They have a normal life where it, their lives do not involve the government and politics, which is very unlike America, where I mean, politics, politics dominate uh, the conversation at home. Uh, right. For example, we're getting ready for the 2024 election. Uh, I mean, this means for the next 16 to 18 months, I mean, we're going to be hammered with political ads every right. single day. It's going to be basically be the dominating news story for the next 16 months. And and unfortunately, it causes so much overwhelm yes. for Americans. Right. Stress. I mean, it's just, you know, a lot of us just want to kind of get on with it. You right. know, like, let's just get on with our jobs. Let's 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 connect with our communities. And I think that's something that you see here in China is, you know, again, I was in my, in my week of traveling here. I've been to music festivals, you know, right. and you just see thousands of people, you know, just doing what just we would do. Right? Their it's daily a Friday life. night. It's a sad, it's a summer day. People are out here enjoying a music festival. There's a street food over here. Um, I mean, here we are on a Sunday. We're walking around this beautiful park. Well, Bridget, I want to thank you so much for sharing your experience and, you know, your journey with the Snowball Capital team, but also just being an American that has, you know, kudos to you there, you know, for having an open mind and, you know, wanting to try something new and, you know, coming to China to experience it for yourself. And Thank that's you. and that's uh, no absolutely and that's this is why these are the stories that I want to highlight on the YouTube channel so the rest of the world can know more about this country and really understand why here's an, an incredible story of an American hedge fund company that moved its locations its headquarters right here Shenzhen China Silicon Valley of China the place to be exactly Thank right. you so much Cyrus My pleasure and it was intense work Yeah it took a year and a half and this yeah. is everything on our end going as you know, overnighting every single type of form. Right. So it took a year and a half. Right. And a lot of this was because of COVID. Right. Ironically, for most people, the, the slowest parts were on the US side. Interesting. So getting things authenticated, getting right. your diplomas and all that, right. that was actually really difficult. The Chinese side on the consulate or embassy's website, they would say, this process is gonna take three weeks and it would take oftentimes a day or two less. Okay. So, uh, yeah, it was a lot of paperwork. I mean, yeah. we measure the paperwork in terms of pounds now. Right. And Jeez. so it was it was a long process, but there's no blueprint for yeah. how to do this. Okay. So we had to to learn everything kind of live. And yeah. and policies were changing. Yeah. And so fortunately, no policies changed so much that it, it made it so we can't be here. Right. Um certainly some policies got more difficult, more stringent, but it was, it was really difficult to move the comp well, to establish a company here. And we didn't want to have a joint venture with a Chinese firm. Right. We wanted it to be wholly owned by ourselves. Right. So yeah. our parent company, it's called a Woofie. Yeah, it's Woofie similar to what say. Tesla did, That's right? right? So Tesla didn't have a joint venture. They were the first automaker to do such a thing in China. Right. And it's turned out very well for them, of course. Absolutely. And so, so we did, we also set up a Woofie. So our parent company in the US is the 100% owner of Gotcha. Our company and, here. and just for everybody at home, a Wolfie is called the wholly owned foreign enterprise. Yep, right. That is the ter terminology for Wolfie. That, that's yep. that's fascinating. So so that so moving the company was one thing. Getting ourselves here was another. Right. Definitely not as difficult. Right. I really would encourage so many people to to move. You know, to to go work for a Chinese company. Uh, Setting up a Chinese company, especially as an American today, is yeah. going to be more difficult. I Correct. think, unfortunately. But yeah, but yeah. actually moving ourselves here, it was a lot of paperwork and you know, but it, it was manageable. Yeah, yeah. And so we eventually did that. Then getting here was maybe the hardest part. Right. And that was, you know, we landed. Right. And at, as an American, it was, it seems that they're a bit, they just don't see that many Americans these days. Right. A lot of the people working at the border have been hired since COVID. And so right. they, they don't know what to really look for. Right. And, and so they were saying, when we landed, we were questioned for over an hour and they were saying, right. call your, call your boss. And it's like, well, I'm the boss. Right. right and right. they were like, no, no, but call them on the phone. And right. I was like, the company, it's my company. And they're like, why haven't you been here since you set up the company? Right. And I was like, I, cause I couldn't, I had yeah. to set up the company to get here. Right. So right. it was, it was, there was confusion. Yeah, yeah. But overall, yeah, it's a process that, um, the government literally did tell us that we're the only wholly owned foreign entity in China yeah. by Americans. 
That's amazing. American only. That's amazing. Yeah. And I think what's so incredible about this story is is just the vision of this and really seeing. And I mean, you you cannot be in a better city than Shenzhen. No. I mean, this is just the. We could choose any city. Yeah, you could choose any city, but I mean, you'd want to be in Shenzhen. We chose right? Shenzhen I mean, for yeah, very obvious reasons. Very obvious reasons here. Tell tell us a little bit about this particular area that we're in because I've seen. I mean, looking outside, it's filled with beautiful skyscrapers, and we've got Alibaba, Baidu, Tencent. I mean, where are we right exactly? That I mean, this is an amazing, um, you know, kind of circle of, of businesses here. Tell, tell us more about this specific area and why your why Snowball Capital is here. Yeah, so this is called Nanshan District, okay. and it's uh, it's more. There's Futian, mm -hmm. which is uh, where you arrived in the train. Yeah, um, that's more of the the CBD. Okay, so the kind of financial district right. of of Shenzhen. Right. Nanshan is more for the tech companies. Okay. And so we want it to be in the area where the tech companies are. Yeah, yeah. And, and maybe not necessarily right on top of another bank or something. Gotcha. So, so the tech companies all around here, I mean, you could go around and see people flying drones. People yeah. arrive to work in robo taxis. I don't think that the people working in finance are maybe necessarily as up to speed okay. on, on that sort of thing. So yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's good to be immersed in this. Okay. Um, and this area is completely, I mean, for the most part, brand new. Yeah. I showed you that that map. It's unbelievable how many new companies are are popping up here. Right. And some of these companies, I mean, the average size can maybe only be four or five. Right. But the amount of money that some of these companies are raising, even yeah. though that small, yeah. is is pretty incredible. So the and the other thing is these the companies around here are creating technologies that you read about it or you see it yourself or you meet with them yeah. and you're like, I didn't even think that that technology, I, I never even thought of that as a technology. Right. And it just, they're creating that. Incredible. So it's, it really, it just blows your mind. Fantastic. So Taylor, I want to know, what about uh, Snowball Capital, your hedge fund? What kind of companies are you investing in? I mean, obviously you're here on the ground in Shenzhen and you, I think you brought a really good cultural insight here is that if, if Chinese, if you want to invest in Chinese companies, they want to, they want to see you. They want to see you on the ground here. And that is, of course, very big in Chinese culture. For example, like you said, learning some of the language, understanding the culture, but having your boots on the ground here. Hey, I'm an American that owns a hedge fund here in Shenzhen. I live full time in this city. Um, how much of, of the companies you're investing in, is it is it 100% Chinese? You have a mix of Western companies as well. Tell us a little bit more about your portfolio. Yeah, it varies. It's certainly not only Chinese companies. Yeah. And it was, even if it were only 25% Chinese companies, yeah. the necessity of living here yeah. is complete. Uh, you need to be here because the research doesn't exist. Right. It kind of existed for, like in a really poor way right. before COVID, right. but now all of those firms pulled out right and and the ones that have remained are in their Hong Kong office you can read the the last names of a report and yeah. say I kind of know how this report's gonna pan right. out on a, on a mainland company right, right. Um, and so so it's it's uh, the the quality of research just went to zero right I mean it almost started going negative because right. they would try to cover a company and, and not get it at all yeah and so that can actually really affect valuations for sure so for us to be here we can see everything live ourselves we right. can tour a factory right i don't want to ever read a report of someone else who visited a factory because they look at a factory completely differently than i right so again it had we had to be here right. just for the research side alone and Amazing. that is something that you just cannot translate any other way oh fantastic insight that's great. So Taylor, I want to know, um, what about the sentiment that you you and your team have received? I, I'm going to go out and say, I, I assume that many people here in China have been very welcoming to you. All foreigners are really welcomed here. Chinese are always very curious about it. Um, how has your reception been here in China? But also, what about back home in America? Our reception in China is, everyone is so kind. Yeah. Everyone. Yeah. If you can't pronounce the word of, a, of where you're going to the taxi driver, yeah. they'll just keep being patient and, and they'll pull over to the side of the road. Imagine hap having that happen in the U.S. Right. right. So no, that every every type of person is incredibly welcoming. Right. Even even the the police officers or you know these tax bureaus who aren't used to dealing with foreigners. Right. Right. They're they're incredibly patient at the bank. I mean, they'll stay after hours right. just because you're there and they want to finish the job. Right. So they're just, they're so welcoming. Yeah. Um, in the United States, uh, our, the reception to us moving here is quite different, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. Um, a lot of our, even our friends and families, right. um, some individuals have 
really expressed uh, some really crazy reasoning behind why we would move here. Right, right. Uh, they have such an antiquated view of right. China. And um, the only thing that we can say to them is, you come here and if you still believe what you believe now, right. uh, I don't know if I really want to associate with you because right. you have to be, sorry, an idiot to, to come here and not see what is happening here. Yeah, I think, and that's why, you know, that's why it's so important for me to come back. I mean, I'm on a uh, week long trip throughout China. This is my fifth city that I visited uh, in the last seven days. I've been on a whirlwind tour, but it's, it's important for me as well because I needed to get back on the ground in 2023 so I can see exactly what's happening in China. What, what is the sentiment here? And I, I agree, I think, I, I feel the same thing. You know, anytime I'm speaking with Chinese and hey, you're American. Uh, I mean, I've been wearing this shirt all throughout my journey, you know, a little US and China flag, hands being shaken. And, and you know, and that's, that's really my role as, you know, a bridge builder, you know, trying to, you know, be a, you know, trying to just make people, you know, look a little bit more object, objectively into China, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good point of where you look at, hey, you know, if you haven't been to China and you haven't seen it, I mean, I don't, it's really hard because we can show you as many photos of the downtown in Shenzhen and how developed the CBD is and just how all of these amazing companies are here. But until, I mean, you know what's incredible is I've seen all that footage too. But now when I come up to your building here today and I'm looking, it's like, oh yeah, here's Baidu headquarters, here's Tencent, here's Alibaba. You know, all of them have other headquarters. This is where all their R&D is. There's robo taxis everywhere. I mean, it's absolutely incredible. I mean, this whole area that we're in, this did not exist when I was last year. When I was last year too. Yeah, yeah. so I mean, this is incredible. I mean, I, I know Shenzhen more as the, the central business district, but this whole area here, I mean, my last visit to Shenzhen was five years ago. This was not here. Yeah. Every building here did not exist. And that's just incredible, that growth. And I mean, and still there's loads of cranes in construction uh, there as well. Probably more than last time you were here. And yeah. you know, last time you were here, Shenzhen was arguably the most advanced city in the world. Yeah. Now, it's not even close. Yeah. The, I, in the last, in the last seven days, I've seen five drone shows just wow. walking around. You, know, nice. you actually see people using robot taxis. Yeah, yeah. There's a part of Shenzhen where the people are saying drone deliveries are the norm. Right. It's not the norm here, but you know yeah, it yeah. varies by districts. And, right, right, right. And the districts are also so competitive. Right. So that's the thing that that's quite unique about Shenzhen is that oh, if one district has they announced that they have fully driverless robo taxis yeah. versus having a human, you know, supervise. Then the district neighboring them will try really hard, and it will be either we you can now measure in hours of right. how long until they approve it. The workforce, they are also they take it so personally. Yeah. They're like, I am in Nanshan, yeah, and yeah. I am going to to innovate and work harder than you. That's right. Um, so yeah, it, it, this is such a unique place, but also I think that's so emblematic of modern China. Yeah, yeah. Really, China has, I know people who, who are born in China and haven't been back in the last, you know, since COVID. Right. And they wouldn't recognize many parts of this. Yeah. And the, the, the amount of apps that just makes things so much more efficient. Ah, it's incredible. The, the, uh, everything, like it, but it's not, like I'll tweet something about, look at, you know, I, I tweeted something, today I took a bullet train and then I rode in multiple robo taxis right. and I had a Chinese student who was there just for fun, right. tell me more than I knew, this is my job, right. about robo, about this specific robo taxi. Right. And then I took a bullet train back all in a day. Right. And people were like, either that's not true. Even people who used to live in China, right expats or even mainland born Chinese, yeah. they were saying that would never happen. Right. A student would never be doing that for fun. Yeah. And it's like, well, you got to come to <laughs> new China because yeah, it's, it's completely different. Well, one of the things we often talk about is China speed, right? Yeah, and yeah. and that, that's a t common phrase that we we'll often use, China speed. And it's really hard to understand just how fast and effective everything moves. It's it's incredibly efficient society. I mean, the last time I was living in China, I mean, we still had cash in society. I mean, it still exists, but generally speaking, it's pretty much a cashless. I mean, I've basically used WeChat Pay for my entire trip, everything from, you know, tax taxis to, air, to the hotel bookings, you know, high-speed bullet, metro, everything. And I mean, even the vendors on the street, I mean, there's a couple of street vendors, you know, just selling things off the back of their truck uh, and every one of them's got the WeChat Pay. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the first thing that you see there. So it's incredible, the speed here. And I think that's, um, what, a, what a testament to you and your team 
for having that courage to go through this long process, but really being on the ground here in China. And also, you guys are doing a great job of, of building that bridge as well. I know you and your team, all Americans here, um, you know, certainly a great representative of our country, but also just helping people understand there's a lot more to China. And I think it's just so important. I mean, you, you now that the border's open, you guys have to be here. You yeah, have to totally, come and experience totally. it because, I mean, China changes in a month. And so when you haven't been back for four years like myself, I mean, it's been very rewarding to come back here and just incredible to see all of these stories. Yeah, and I really appreciate your approach to this in, in really bridging the United States and China as friends. Yeah. And I wish that more people would, would think of it that way, yeah. not as competitors, because the Chinese don't see it as competitors. Right. And and so you are, we kind of joke in the office that, that wow, Cyrus is so reserved. Like, how can he be so kind? We even were confused. We were like, is Cyrus Canadian? Yeah. <laughs> um, and, but, but really, I mean, hats off to you for, for how calm and collected you are throughout all this. Because I appreciate it. we can't be. Yeah. I mean, we, it's just, it's too frustrating for us right. that we're, we're either like, I just don't, you know what? If someone really thinks that, uh, like my colleague got a text when there are all these wildfires in New York City and he said, hey, Jack, the, uh, New York City looks like China. And we're, we're at the point where like, I don't want to explain to that person that that's just not true anymore. Right. They've had enough opportunities. Right. And so then you're just like, you ignore it or, but, but you do a great job in, in really trying to educate people on that. Yeah. So it's something um, that, that is really impressive. So well, this is why it. we watch your videos all the time. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. And, you know, I mean, as far as, as far as that, I mean, our, our goal is always, you know, to, to build bridges, but also just to offer a little bit of nuance. I mean, like you said, I love what you said with the learning the language and understanding the culture, because if you, you know, it starts with that. And there's, and if you, you know, if you come to China with, with your expectations of, of, you know, this is what China should be like, you know, in America, we do things this way, you know, you're going to have a very difficult time in China, right? Yeah. You know, you're, you're going to have to come here and really come with an open mind and try to learn more because one of the other things you'll see is that there's a lot of Chinese people that are very proud of their country and what it has been able to do over the last 40 years and also the current trajectory. Like you said, I mean, you know, people, like, we're here actually recording this on a Sunday morning here in uh, Shenzhen, but it's like, hey, if you were on Saturday, this entire office would be full of people. Oh, yeah, yeah. People are hustling all the time. And it's an amazing, you know, culture of this hustle. And this is a testament to why, you know, Shenzhen really is the most advanced, most modern uh, city in the world. Yeah. And I, th I think also that people who want to visit China, yeah. whether they have or haven't, visiting China is the first step. Yeah. I think we are at the point where multiple people watching your videos should be thinking to themselves, damn, should I move there too? Yeah. And I think that they should. Yeah, yeah. Because something that I didn't understand until I got here was that you think of China as the place of opportunity now. Right. Um, at least I think the people watching your videos do. Yeah. Uh, but what I was thinking was, yeah, but I, I won't be able to, to play ice hockey. Right. Or I won't be able to uh, find some random thing. And that was the case many of the times that I've, I had been to China. Right. But that's also different when you actually move here. Right. You get to see China in a completely different way. And what's shocking to me and my colleagues is that we can find anything in China. Like right. it, it, if you want to go indoor skydiving, I was like, that's something that I probably won't be able to do until I go to, you know, Dubai or back to the US or something. Right. No, you can go on Meituan and there are like five different indoor skydiving places in this district. Jeez, so that's it's amazing. The, you can find anything in terms of like, yeah. I wanted specific deodorant. You yeah. can just order that. Yeah, yeah. And so that's the, the, the weird hurdles that people inherently have for not moving to a completely unknown place yeah, yeah. no longer exist here. Yeah. And you don't even have to speak the language. It definitely yeah. helps, but it's possible. And, yeah. and I really think people should do it. Well, I, you know, I, I often I often get emails every single week from, you know, young people in their early 20s uh, wanting to study Chinese, wanting to come to China. And it's the first thing I say, absolutely. When you're, I mean, it's exactly my career path. You know, when I graduated university, I had an opportunity to go to China two weeks after graduation, bought a one-way ticket to Shanghai, had a two-year contract, ended up staying for 10. And that's just what happens in China. But absolutely. I mean, if you are a young person watching this video and you are thinking to yourself, you know, should I go to China? You know, is it worth trying? The answer is yes. 
Even if you're a retiree. Yeah. I mean, it would, yeah. would what a beautiful place yeah, to retire. Yeah. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, you yeah. get to travel all over Asia. And absolutely. yeah, no, I really think that. Yeah, and, and we will see that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. Well, Taylor, thank you so much for taking time. It's yeah, been an absolute pleasure to meet you. Big fan. And everybody, we're going to put some of the links down to Snowball Capital down in the description below because I want you to learn more about his hedge fund. But it's really just an amazing story because him and his team, they're doing a great job here. And again, I'm just very honored to be here in Shenzhen. Thank you for welcoming me to the beautiful Nanshan district here and to see all of this new development it's uh you know you have to have your boots on the ground as we've said and you guys are doing a great job thank you everybody make sure that you like this video and uh, of course drop us some comments down below we'd love to hear from you thanks for spending time with us today here on youtube i look forward to seeing you all in our next video soon